it's a Judaism. And uh, just to uh, very briefly uh, recap, we're having a look at what is roughly equivalent to the right effort of an ovulatory partner. And of course, that right effort, it blends into uh, meditation practice, like mindfulness and all of these things. It's all kind of a little bit mixed up. But it's part of the, uh, uh, the gradual training here. And we're still kind of looking at how to overcome defilements, how to clarify the mind, how to get ready for meditation practice. So. And uh, the next sutta, I'm going to just leave out the last simile for that uh, other sutta for now, because uh, uh, I don't think it's really, you don't need to have to do absolutely everything. Uh, you can have a look at it for yourself if you like. Uh, but now I would like to move on to the next sutta, which is called Themes. And, uh, and this sutta uh, is uh, uh, interesting because it is, uh, as you will see here, it is a sutta which, talk, which is basically very universal, uh, applic universally applicable for everybody. This is one of the things that makes it kind of interesting, I suppose. So, so uh, let us just try get into it uh, and see what it has to say here. Because uh, there are these five themes that should often be reflected upon by a woman or a man, by a householder or one going forward. Uh, what five? And uh, the first thing which is interesting here, of course, is that this sutta specifically says that this is a theme for reflection for both those who live the household life and those who are going forward. Uh, that is already interesting because it's not a very common way uh, that the sutta has begun. This is quite unusual in a sense. Uh, and it obviously is to make a point that these are important reflections for everyone. Uh, what is also a little bit interesting here is that you would notice that it has a sequence of woman or a man. Uh, the woman comes first, uh, yeah? which is uh, kind of unusual. The sutta has tend to be fairly male-centric. Uh, but this is one of those instances where actually it says the woman comes first, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is fascinating here. Yeah. Just to kind of make that point uh, that it's not always 100% kind of uh, uh, male-oriented. Uh, sometimes it is uh, it's a bit, little bit more diverse than that. Uh, which is good. So, what are these five themes? A woman or a man, a householder or one going forward should often reflect thus. I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. A woman or a man, a householder one going forward should often reflect thus. I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. A woman or a man, a householder one going forward should often reflect thus. I'm subject to death. I'm not exempt from death. A woman or a man, a householder or one gone forward, should often reflect thus. I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. A woman or a man, a householder or one gone forward, should often reflect thus. I'm the owner of my kama, the heir of my kama. I have kama as my origin, kama as my relative, kama as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever comma, good or bad, that I do have. So this is the summary again. The five things to be reflected upon. And it sounds a bit grim, doesn't it, to reflect on these things? This may be why sometimes Buddhists get a bit of a bad reputation for being very negative and whatever. But of course, that is not the point. The point of these kind of reflections is not to make life miserable or whatever. There's enough problems in life already. You don't have to add to the problems. Uh, the purpose, of course, is to improve the quality of life. Uh, and this is kind of one of those strange things. If you face up to things, face up to the problems of life, uh, you look things uh, you know, in the eye, uh, you, you, you see what is, uh, what is actually there, uh, and you deal with it in a, in a good way, and usually it improves the quality of life. And this is kind of the point here, of course. So uh, facing up to the realities uh, usually <coughs> improves things. Uh, and that is what, of course, this is about. Uh, so how exactly does it improve things? And this is, uh, this is how then these reflections are done according to the Buddha. <coughs> Let's just go through them one by one and just comment a little bit on each one of them. For the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one come forth? Often reflect thus, I am subject to old age, I am not exempt from old age. In their youth, beings are intoxicated with their youth. And when they are intoxicated with the youth, they engage with the misconduct by body, speech, and mind. 
that when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with youth is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one conformed, should often reflect thus, I am subject to old age, I am not exempt from old age. So the idea here is that when we don't see life clearly, we get intoxicated. This is a theme that you see in so many different places in the sutras, the idea of intoxicated. There are so many sources of intoxication in life. But obviously alcohol and drugs is one source, but that is not the only source. There are so many things that lead us astray, where our mind is not straight, our mind is, has a vested interest in the outcome or whatever. And of course part of this is because we are attached to the idea of being young in this case, or to life or whatever it is. So we hold on to these things. When we are attached to them, we have a vested interest in it. We don't have clarity about things. We know that we're going to get old in one way, but in another way we don't really know that. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, we know but we don't know. It's one of those slight paradoxes. Uh, we know but not very deeply, not profoundly. Uh, we don't have clarity about it. Uh, and this is the purpose of this, to be clear about these things. Uh, and then when you get clarity in your mind, uh, the intoxication leaves. Uh, that is when you uh, know what is what should be done in this life and what is important to do. Uh, and that's why you... This makes it clear to you that you, should, you have to live well. Just because you're young doesn't mean that you have time to waste. Yeah? Every opportunity is important. Every moment matters. Uh, because life actually is pretty short. Uh, you don't have that many years uh, before you know it's all gone. Uh, and then it's too late unless you take the opportunity now. Huh? And um, one of the, there's a number of ways you can do this contemplation. But one of the ways that I sometimes do is to simply remind myself that old age is already part of me. It's already in here. If you're young, you know, it's not that I'm all that young, but uh, <laughs> if you are young, you're going to get old. Yeah? Youth and old age are two opposite sides of the coin. They always have to go together. Yeah? One side implies the other one. The other side implies the first one. <laughs> so regardless of what your age is, all of these things are already in you. They're already part of you. You're just waiting to come out. Yeah, you can sort of feel the old age inside of you waiting to come out, waiting to sprout out and become a reality. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. And of course, if you are getting older, you know, middle age or whatever it is, uh, then of course, eventually you will get young again as well. So these things are all just always revolving around each other, already part of it. Uh, so if you see yourself in a certain way as already being old, and these things already being part of you, uh, then of course uh, it is... a. Uh, uh, you don't kind of get intoxicated in the same way uh, because it's already part of you. Uh. And uh, uh, in another sutta, the Buddha talks about old age and he says uh, how people often get slightly uncomfortable around people who are very old. Uh. Yeah, how they feel slightly disgusted almost because when you see someone who is really, really old uh, and, you know, about to die, they can't look hard for themselves, they need care 24 hours, the most basic things have to be done for them. Uh. It's kind of uncomfortable, yeah, because you read deep down you realize that you are going to head, be heading in the same direction. Eh? Are you ready for that? Eh? Are you ready to have nurses look after you almost all the time? There's nothing you can do for yourself anymore. You can't get dressed, you can't go to the toilet anymore for yourself. Eh? It's kind of humiliating almost. Eh? You're used to being free, used to being you know, independent in the world. Eh? And now you are there. Are you ready for that? Eh? Can you feel, are you, you know, are you, can you feel that it's already inside of you? Can you feel that this is already part of you? Are you ready to be in that situation? And that is a question. If you feel humiliated by it, well, then you are humiliated by an aspect of yourself because you know it's going to have to come out. You're disgusted about something which is already part of you. So you have to be able to kind of deal with this. It's already there. It's already, you know it's going to come out. In this way, when you reflect like this, it tends to lead to a little bit of clarity, a little bit of uh, realism about what life is about. And what happens then? Well, if you're not intoxicated, what happens is that the defilements die down. This is kind of the point. Yeah? You get clarity, you start to act appropriately. You understand that there is no time to be wasted. Now is the chance to live well. Now is the opportunity to do what is good. Uh, and then it, uh, it becomes a, a source for good in your life but when you reflect in this way. Uh, <coughs> These reflections, by the way, are the reflections that the Buddha had before he decided to go forth. Uh, and for the Buddha, that was enough 
to decide to go forward, especially the death reflection. And then he became a monk and he became awakened on that basis. Yeah, so these are actually very powerful reflections. They are sufficient to, to get you onto the path and all the way to awakening if you use them in the right way. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. Uh, and for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one going forward, often reflect thus? I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. In a state of health, beings are intoxicated with their health. And when they are intoxicated with the health, they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. But when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with health is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. So this is obviously very similar to the previous one. The idea that uh, uh, illness is kind of part of life, part and parcel of who we are as human beings. Uh, nothing has gone wrong when you become ill. Yeah, I'm sick. Oh no, something has gone wrong. Nothing has gone wrong. Uh, health and sickness are two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you're health, healthy, sickness, health only has a meaning in relation to sickness. The very fact that we have the word health means uh, that sickness is just around the corner here. Yeah. And uh, so nothing goes wrong when you get sick. And it's very nicely uh, encapsulated by Adam Brahma's with the saying about when you go to the doctor, you should tell the doctor, 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 something is right with me again. I'm sick today. Yeah, yeah nothing is wrong with you. Something is right with you. Yeah. And then the doctor sends you off to the psychiatrist the next day. <laughs> 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 so uh, that's the downside of it. Yeah. But uh, it's true, isn't it? Nothing has really gone wrong when you get sick. It's kind of this is nature. This is part and part. This is what we can expect. So um, uh, because of that, again, once you remember that, uh, you don't you don't kind of get te too excited about being healthy, about being in good shape, about things being right, uh, because you understand actually it's just temporary. Uh, and there's a beautiful simile that Adam Shah used to use. You know the simile of the glass. Uh, he would uh, hold up the glass and he would say, can you see the crack in this glass? You know the simile? Some of you probably know the simile. Can you see the crack in the glass? Uh, but no, no, can't see any crack yet. And he said, actually, the, glass, the crack is already there. The glass is already on the way. It's too breaking. Eventually, this glass will break. We know that. Uh, yeah, in the same way as the body will eventually break up, uh, this glass will eventually break. So what do you do? You look after it. Uh, you care for it uh, to ensure that it, you know, uh, because you know it's fragile, you know it's going to break eventually. Yeah. This is what we do as well in this case. Uh, we don't get, don't get heedless about things, uh, and then usually uh, that turns out to be to our benefit. Uh. So illness also, just like old age, is part of, part of life. Uh, then we come to the third one, and this is by far the most important one of these three. Uh, the three first ones are... And uh, the Buddha says, and for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, uh, often reflect thus, uh, I am subject to death, I am not exempt from death. Uh, during their lives, being, beings are intoxicated with life, uh, and when they are intoxicated with life, they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. And when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with life is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus, I am subject to death, I am not exempt from death. So this is by far the most important one of these three, because it kind of encapsulates the two previous ones as well. If you get getting old, you get ill, of course, death also is often just around the corner. It kind of uh, summarizes all the three reflections, if you like it. And uh, the reason why you know it is the most important one is because it is found throughout the suttas. Uh, the Buddha gives a large number of examples of death contemplations and death reflections. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and this is by far the most common one of these three. So it is the, the most important one. Uh, it's the most powerful one because Death really is a abs like an absolute cutting off point. Uh, and there's many reasons why death is slightly frightening. First of all, death is frightening because we have to let go of everything. Uh, 
it was kind of scary and but also of course because you're going into some unknown that's also why it's scary you're not really sure exactly where you're going it also makes it kind of slightly scary when you're when you're down here so the buddha uh, emphasizes this contemplation a lot uh, because it really clears out the nonsense in the mind uh, and the way that he talks about this in the suttas the first thing is to bring the death into the present moment uh, not your way to think, yeah, I'm going to die, it's a long way away, yeah, it's kind of not going to happen today at least, you know, so I can just, uh, but bring it as close to the present moment as you possibly can. And the ideal way, the Buddha says, to contemplate death is to uh, be ready to die on the next breath. That's pretty challenging. Yeah, if you try, try that, try and see if you are ready to die on the next breath. Uh, Actually, it's quite hard to do, and it's, it's almost, you know, it's actually quite difficult. But that is the ideal um, development of this particular perception. And that's really bringing it into the present moment. And this is why I was suggesting yesterday, when you do the death contemplation, you don't have to do what I did yesterday. You can do something like that if it works for you, and you don't have to do it at all if you don't want to. But uh, the idea is to actually really be ready at the end of this thing to really be dead, yeah? What if I am going to be dead at the end of this thing here? It could, could be the case that this is actually a real preparation for dying here. So you have the sense that at the end of this meditation, whether you're dead or alive, it's fine, whatever, whatever is, is okay here. That's what makes it real. That's when it works. If it is just a pure imagina a pure kind of uh, effort in, in imagination, it doesn't really grab you in the same way here. You have to make it realistic. And one of the ways of making it realistic that the Buddha talks about is to remind yourself how easily you could die. You know, you, uh, you can walk out into the traffic here, it's quite not so bad, but in London, yeah, or the big cities of the world, or on the highway somewhere, the, the, the motorway, whatever it is, and it's so easy that some car just kind of knocks you over and, and you finished it. Yeah, and you walk through the forest yesterday, I went for a bit of walk around here, and I I went into this airfield up there, yeah, I didn't know there was an airfield there, there was no fences or anything like that, I started walking across this airfield, and then this car comes up to me and says, you're walking in the middle of the airfield, there's a air plane coming in, and I'm really not <laughs> Okay, so he got me into the car and drove me off, and the plane came down. <laughs> That shows you, yeah, I want to tell that it's okay, you know, if I die, it's not problem, I would say, but actually, I didn't, I didn't say that, it would freak him out. <laughs> so this, this shows you how, you know, how kind of easily things can happen here. Or you just walk along the path, you stumble on something, you fall over, and bang, you're dead if you're unlucky here. So, uh, uh, this is the point, uh, yeah, it happens so easily, and of course, we usually think it's not going to be us, that's part of the problem, we think it's going to be someone else, if you read uh, the obituaries in the newspaper, uh, it, it doesn't really, yeah, okay, this person died, yeah, okay, it's good enough. It doesn't really feel that it has anything to do with you. It feels like it's somebody else's problem. It's actually, yeah, you know, they did something stupid or who knows what. Uh, but actually, the point is that could have been you. There's no difference probably between that person and you. The chances of you dying are probably just the same as the chance of that person dying. Uh, you just don't know. So when you read the obituary, it should actually give you a wake up call. Uh, she said, wait a minute, here is a young person, or a person my age, or whatever, who had just died. Of course it could have been you. That's the whole point. Yeah, and this is one of the great things about being a monk. We do so many funeral services. And when you do funeral services, most of the time it's for the people who are old. Yeah, they kind of reach the end of their life and they pass away. But sometimes it is for middle-aged people. Sometimes it is for young people. Occasionally, it is for babies. It is tiny little comments. Yeah, so baby has passed away. Yeah. And after a while, we start to realize that this is the nature of things, the nature of life. It is so unpredictable. Yeah. And uh, once you get into this idea, yeah, right now, it could be an illness inside of you. You read about the younger and younger people getting cancers these days and dying because of cancer. Yeah, yeah. maybe there's a cancer in me right now. I have a brother, a, si a sister, and a father both suffering from cancer. So quite likely I have it too, probably genetically programmed, so where is it? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, probably because we all probably all have this cancer cell just waiting to kind of you know get the right conditions for them to start multiplying madly and then before you know it you, you are in the same position. Or heart disease. So many people die because of heart attacks and these kind of things. 
So the possibility is always so close. It is always just around the corner. And this is what makes it real, to remember that. It is not someone else's problem, it is your problem too, in a very real sense. And when you get this, what starts to happen? And this is one of the things that, you know, the idea of the death contemplation is supposed to do. What starts to happen is that you realize that all of the things, all of our involvement in this world, they are kind of silly. Yeah, yes, we are. We think, always think about the future. We think about what we're going to do in our life. We think about, we crave for things. We're going to have, we think about whatever. But if you know you're going to die, you're not going to think about the next house, the next relationship, the next car, the next plan that you have. It, all of that becomes silly. It becomes stupid. So using the death contemplation in the right way, it actually allows you to let go of all the little silliness in this world. Let go of all of that, and it brings you back to the present moment. So if you do the death contemplation in the right way, it should make you peaceful. Because all of the things that belong to this world, actually, they become irrelevant. You're not going to get angry. Yeah? You're not going to get upset with people if you're dying. If you are on your deathbed, the last thing you're going to do is to pick an argument with someone. Then. Yeah? <laughs> what? You said that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you really enjoy arguing. I mean. <laughs> so, because you want to be peaceful when you die. You know you're leaving this world. Yeah, what other people say it becomes kind of irrelevant. You say, from the now, you're out of here. You're going somewhere else. So you let things be. And this is what you see when people die in a very skillful way. When you see people on the deathbed, you see people in hospital, people who have lived well, perhaps people who have been Buddhist and doing meditation practice or whatever. Those people who die well, they die peacefully then. Why? Because they're letting go. They understand that there is no choice but to let go. You're moving, get, getting there. So what we are trying to do here, we're trying to get the benefits of the dying process, bring that into the present, rather than waiting until we die when it's going to be too late anyway. We're trying to draw that benefit into the present moment. Use the idea of that now, make it real now has a double benefit. It makes you peaceful now, and it helps you to make you ready when it actually, eventually, will happen. This is the idea of the death contemplation. It's actually a very beautiful contemplation. Yeah? People are afraid of these kind of things, but when we get it right, it's beautiful because you become peaceful. You become calm. You don't kind of cling on to things so much anymore. You start to let go of things. It's actually it enhances your quality of life. It doesn't detract from the quality of life. It makes your quality of life better when you get these things right. And then, of course, on top of all that, because it clarifies the mind, it takes away the desires and the ill will and all the defilements of the mind, it also makes it clear how you should live. Yeah? It makes it easier to be kind. It makes it easier to do all the right things. So there are endless benefits, or not endless, but there are enormous amount of benefits from this death contemplation. And as I said before, this was the thing that made the Buddha to be uh, renounced a household life. The three things that he talks about, and this is in the Sutta in, in the Anguttara 3, is number 39, the, what is it called, Sukkoma Sutta, like the delicate, I think is the uh, uh, probably common translation into English. And these are the three things that made the Buddha go forth. Yeah? Illness, old age, and uh, death especially that, and knowing that. And if you go to the uh, Majjhima Nikaya 26, the, uh, the Noble Search, the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, is exactly the same thing. The Buddha sit, th uh, sits, he thinks to himself, uh, here I am, subject to death myself, subject to defilement, subject to old age. And then I go out and I seek all these other things that are also subject to that. Uh, seeking a wife, seeking a child, seeking a family, seeking all these possessions that are also subject to disappearing. Uh, you know, it's, it's madness. I already have a problem enough in for myself, and then I seek out other things which have exactly the same problems. Uh, crazy. And then uh, from that, he changes his mind and realizes, no, I'm not going to go there. Instead of seeking these things, I'm going to seek the freedom from these things. Uh, the freedom from death, the freedom from old age, uh, the freedom from illness. Uh, sometimes this is translated as the deathless, yeah, or the... Or the uh, but I think the point there is that what the Buddha is searching for is a freedom from these things, not a state which you can call the deathless. So, <coughs> so this, is, um, this is what this is about. And so it's very powerful in the sense that for the Buddha, it actually, for the Buddha to be, it meant the very beginning of the spiritual path. 
when you see these things clearly, and especially when you see it in the context of rebirth and the context of these things going on indefinitely into the future, uh, they become very powerful reflections. Uh. Mm. So don't underestimate these things uh, and see if you can. It's always good to develop some of these very basic reflections a little bit. Uh. So uh, see if this is one of the reflections that you can do in daily life, uh, especially if you feel a bit agitated, you can't be peaceful. Uh, remind yourself that you're going to die. Make it real. Yeah? And then uh, see how that, uh, how that works for you. Uh. And of course, all of these things, all of these reflections, uh, they are not things you can do once or twice and expect it to work. You have to do it again and again and again. And as you do it again and again, it becomes a power, a force in your spiritual life, something you can rely on. And you can bring it out whenever it is required to calm you down, to still the mind, and to kind of give you a sense of direction in, in life. Okay. The next one. And for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one go forth, often reflect thus. I must depart it and separate it from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. Beings have desire and lust in regard to those people and things that are dear and agreeable, and excited by this lust they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. And when one often reflects upon this theme, the desire and lust in regard to everyone and everything dear and agreeable is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. <coughs> this is very similar idea to the idea of the borrowed goods that we had a look at yesterday. You can remember the simile of the borrowed goods. Everything in life is borrowed. Because it is borrowed, it must all be separated from you. The rightful owner of everything in your life ultimately is nature. And nature is always going to come and claim back its own. And it will then take it away from you. In the midst of you gripping onto these things, nature is going to come and take it back again. And that's when you suffer accordingly. Yeah, so everything in your life is going to be separated and uh, from you. Uh, so a very useful contemplation. It, it, uh, it kind of uh, complements the death contemplation. The death contemplation is about your own death, uh, and this is really about the death of everyone else, or the death, death of the things that you own in life. In other words, the fact that they are impermanent, uh, and they must be separated from you. Uh. So what does this do when you think about this in the right way? Well, what it does, it uh, reduces your grasping a little bit, yeah, you know that you must be separated, you don't hold quite so hard onto these things anymore, and you let go a little bit, so just that reflection already helps, but it's not going to take you all the way, because uh, some degree of grasping, some degree of attachment is actually part uh, of being human, it's part of having, having an ego, a sense of self, yeah, so some attachment will always be there, you have to also develop the path in the same way. So there's two things that help you to detach from things in the world. One is this kind of reflection that reminds you of the impermanence of things. This is really a reflection on impermanence. All of these things are reflections on impermanence, really. And at the same time, by developing your own mind, developing an internal happiness, an alternative source of happiness for yourself, and it means that it's easier to let go of external things because the happiness starts to come from inside of you rather than through external things of the world. Yeah, and these two things together, creating an internal source of happiness and reflecting on the danger of the external things, that's when kind of you know you you're able to let go of, of things in this way. So um, and this is a, an important point that all of these reflections are reflections about impermanence. People often ask how do you contemplate impermanence? And there is a deeper way of contemplating that, and that is done through your meditation practice, and we're going to have a look at that later on, uh, today or tomorrow morning or whatever. And uh, so that is one side, but that is kind of towards the very end of the spiritual path. Uh, when you see the five kandhas, you see your personality, uh, you see who you are as you know, inherently impermanent and problematic. That's a very deep kind of insight. Uh, but already, this is deep enough. This already is very deep. Yeah, don't underestimate these very simple reflections. It sounds simple, but actually, it is not simple. These things are really profound. 
And this is the right way of contemplating things like impermanence. It's going to take you a long way on the path, but you will actually see that in a second how far it can take you. But when the Buddha says, contemplate impermanence, well, this actually is a very important part of life. Right? People don't often don't think about it. I think impermanence, oh, it's about sitting in meditation, seeing kind of all phenomena arising and passing away. <coughs> yeah, this like, is also part of it, but this is a, 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 also a very important aspect of it. <clears throat> Let's go on to the last one then. And for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one go forth, often reflect thus? I am the owner of my kama, the heir of my kama. I have kama as my origin, kama as my relative, kama as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever kama, good or bad, but I do. People engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. And when one often reflects upon this thing, such misconduct is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, uh, should often reflect thus. I am the owner of my kama, the heir of my kama. I have kama as my origin, kama as my relative, kama as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever kama, good or bad, that I do. So this is simply a reflection on kama. Kama means action, yeah, it does not mean result, it actually means action. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so you are the owner of your kama, yeah, you have to take responsibility for these things. Uh, when you act, you can't blame anyone else, you are going to have to get the results. Uh, so even though we are conditioned by other people, even though other people influ influence it us very strongly sometimes, and we almost feel compelled to do things because other people have an influence on us, still you have to take responsibility here. You have to stand up for what is right in your life. You have to have a certain degree of strength about yourself. Yeah? And this is, of course, one of the reasons why Kalyanamitta is so important, because they help you to strengthen your resolve, especially in the face of adverse uh, uh, things being difficult for you. Huh? Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, so you have, in, in the end, you are the owner, you are responsible. It's kind of scary in a sense, you're taking on all this responsibility. But it's actually, it is scary on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's also very freeing. Yeah? When you are in charge of your own life, uh, it frees you up and it makes you feel that actually I can do something for myself. It's not in the hand of some uh, God who you don't know what this God wants for you or does not want for you, yeah? but you are in charge. Yeah? So you are the owner of the kama, you are the heir of your kama, yeah? Down the track, you will have to reap the results of this kama. I have kama as my origin. In other words, you are born from your kama. You, the, the round of existence continues because of your kama. Your actions are the cause for this whole samsaric process. What is samsara? Sometimes people think that samsara is like the universe going on. But samsara really is the personal process of being reborn and dying. Yeah? It is your internal uh, exper experiential state that kind of goes on and on and on. That is really what samsara means. Uh, it is your internal experience of the world. Uh, yeah? So this is what or originates or keeps the samsaric process going, is your kama. Uh, kama as my origin, kama as my relative, uh, and the kama bandhu, and uh, the word bandhu is actually derived from the word to bind. It's the same word as bind in English. Bandhati in Pali also means to bind. Yeah? Uh, and so you have, you have your kama as your bond, if you like. You are bound by kama. Kama ties you down. And it's very similar to this idea of being tied, tied to the samsaric trans transmigration, going around and around and around. You're tied, fettered to the world. You have ball and chain around your leg. You're fettered to down and you're held onto this kind of uh, eternal revolving around uh, Kama as your relative. And lastly, Kama as your resort. And this does not mean a beach resort. Yeah. <laughs> this means like a resort, like uh, something which, um, uh, something you resort to, yeah, it's something you resort to, to, to use uh, as a something beneficial in your life. Pati Sadhana is a part that's related to Sadhana, which um, uh, which means refuge. So in a sense you can say kama is your refuge. And if, to make kama your refuge, you have to make good kama, so that you actually uh, enjoy life as a consequence. If kama is bad, it's not really a proper refuge for you. Uh, 
the good karma is your uh, is going to be your uh, refuge in this particular particular case. So this is there's some ideas about karma and how to how to think about it uh, and why it is problematic. Uh, there's so many aspects to it here. Now. So um, uh, I don't know if there is much more to be said about karma. Actually, there's heaps to be said about karma, but uh, just to maybe leave it at that for here, just to uh, give you a rough idea of what this is about. Uh, and uh, again, of course, this if you use this in the right way, it helps you to kind of guide you in the right direction and to get you going on the path. Uh, so now we kind of have a look at the last part of this sutta, and this is also quite interesting because it shows you the power of these particular reflections. This noble disciple reflects thus, I am not the only one who is subject to old age, not exempt from old age. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are subject to old age. None are exempt from old age. As the author reflects on this theme, the path is generated. It pursues this path, develops it and cultivates it. As it does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. Yeah, so the first part here is that I am not the only one who is subject to old age, not exempt from old age. All beings yeah, are, are subject to these things. Yeah. All beings everywhere. Yeah. And this is an important point because you start off by thinking about yourself uh, and looking at your own existence and your own life. Uh, but there comes a point when you universalize this and you realize this is a universal truth that is applicable to all situations. Uh, there is no such thing as kind of finding a rebirth somewhere or a way of living that is exempt from these things. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, all beings, regardless of situation, are subject to these things. Uh, and this is very closely related to the idea of understanding karma you know, as a second uh, of the aspects of insight, rebirth, and you have the ideas of karma, and ultimately you get awakened, you understand uh, that this is a universal thing, there is no corner of samsara that you can find which is exempt for these things, and if you can leave samsara complete and hang out just outside the boundaries of samsara, that too doesn't really work. Yeah. You will always, this is universal truth of existence, uh, that this is the way things are. Uh, and once you get that, uh, once you see that this is universal, uh, that is when you uh, get this great insight that this is really, this is fundamentally problematic, uh, and you want to get off the entire wheel of rebirth. Uh, you get you know, fed up with everything. You push it aside. You get repelled by it, uh, and because you are repelled by it, uh, all of these things, uh, then uh, as you often reflect on that theme, the path is generated. And the path is generated means that you become a stream entry. That's what a stream entry does. Uh, suddenly you have seen the truth for yourself, you have seen the reality for yourself, uh, and as you have done that, uh, you uh, internalize the path. It becomes part of your psychology, part of your very being. And if it's part of your psychology, you have to practice the path, yeah, because it's inside of you, you have no choice anymore. Uh, you have internalized it. This is what the idea of the path being generated is about. Uh, so, a simple reflection like this, old age, uh, can take you all the way to that point if you understand the full ramification, the full implications of, uh, of this problem, of what it actually means. Uh, and then, of course, once the path is internalized, once you have it, uh, then you pursue it, develop it, cultivate it. In, in fact, you haven't got much choice, really, uh, because it's become part of you. And as you do that, the fetters are entirely abandoned. Fetters are the the, the ropes that tie you down, you know, the ball and chain that kind of uh, doesn't kind of give you any room for maneuvering here. It's quite handy to have the fetters around, isn't it? Uh, it's not fetters doesn't sound very good. Uh, so get the fetters gone, that's sort of it's a positive thing here. Yeah. And the underlying tendencies are uprooted, and this is are the anusias. Uh, these are the things that even if you are temporarily free of defilements, if the anusias are there, the defilements come back again. So this is the kind of uprooting of all defilements. Uh, this is kind of, this is sort of the purpose of the path. And this is the difference between samadhi and insight, is that samadhi is a temporary removing of the defilement. So insight leads to the complete abandoning and uprooting of the defilement. So removing of the underlying uh, tendencies. So. And um, uh, the rest of this is pretty much the same, the same idea throughout here, uh, throughout with all of these reflections. Uh, 
So I'll just read through them fairly quickly here. <clears throat> this noble disciple reflects us. I am not the only one who is subject to illness, not exempt from illness. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are subject to illness, not are exempt from this. This is a universal truth. You cannot avoid it. As long as you exist, this is what's going to happen to you. As he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. He pursues this path, develops it, and cultivates it. As he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned, and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. The noble disciple reflects thus, I am not the only one who is subject to death, not exempt from death. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are subject to death. None are exempt from death. Death, too, is a universal reality, and it cannot escape it, inescapable as long as you are part of samsaric existence. As he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. He pursues it, this path, develops it, and cultivates it. As he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned, and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. This noble disciple reflects thus, I am not the only one who must be departed and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable. As he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. He pursues this path, develops it and cultivates it. As he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. This noble disciple reflects thus, I am not the only one who is the owner of my kama, the owner of the heir of my kama, who has kama as my origin, kama as my relative, kama as my resort, who will be the heir of my kama, uh, good or bad, whatever I do. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are owners of the kama, Heirs of the Kama all have Kama as their origin, Kama as their relative, or Kama as their bond, bond if you like, Kama as their uh, refuge. All would be heirs of whatever Kama, good or bad, that they do. As you often reflect on this theme, the path is generated. You pursue that path, develop it, and cultivate it. And as you do so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. So, sounds easy, yeah. You just all you do is reflect on these things, and bang, there you are. You are enlightened as a consequence. But of course, the reality is that uh, you cannot just do this one reflection in isolation. Yeah, These reflections, they may be very powerful, but they are particularly powerful when you practice them in conjunction with the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, in this case, uh, these reflections are only going to have the results they have if you have samadhi first. First of all, you have to have samadhi, and samadhi only comes about if you practice the first uh, seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, really, you need the, the support of all the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path for this sort of reflection to really penetrate. And this is kind of the point here. And this is one of the things that you see in the dependent liberation sequence that we talked about before is that uh, it says in there that uh, from the samadhi comes the yatabhuta manavasana. Seeing things according to reality always comes from samadhi. Samadhi is the thing that makes that possible. Without samadhi, there can be no seeing of things in accordance with reality. Yeah. And this is one of the themes throughout the suttas, uh, yeah, which you see again and again and again. Yeah. So that is the uh, kind of requirement here, which otherwise it uh, doesn't really bite the reflection. Yeah. Okay, so there you are, that is the uh, themes, uh, and uh, I think what I will do now is actually start the Ratapala Sutta, because we have uh, so there is still a few suttas, a couple of suttas to go through, uh, and uh, time, as always, gets a little bit tight towards the end of the retreat, so we might as well get started with this one. I don't really want to kind of give you too much information in one session, but sometimes it, this, unfortunately, it seems to happen anyway, so... Uh, we're just going to, I think we just go slowly on with this Ratapama Sutta. And uh, I'm not going to say too much about it, but because uh, uh, I don't think we really need to, but a lot of the themes that are here we have already spoken about before. Now. 
Uh, but the Ratapala Sutta is very, one of the nice things about it is actually the origin story behind it. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether I should get into that because uh, it's. Uh, uh, but I can maybe very, very briefly just summarize the origin story because it's, it's a nice little origin story and it uh, kind of uh, gives you some ideas about the, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, it gives you some ideas about the Dhamma, I suppose. Uh, <coughs> And this is a story at the time of the Buddha. There was this young man, he was called Vratapala, and one day he hears that the Buddha has arrived in his village or town. Uh, Tunakotita is the name of that town. And uh, uh, everyone in this town, they hear that the Buddha has come. They are this Arahant, this master. Because in India in those days, it was a very religious society, and almost everyone was interested in religious practices, it seems. Yeah, it was, this was very much part of the culture at that time. And then they would look out for people who claimed to be enlightened and arahants or whatever, and then people would come to people's towns and cities. And as people, uh, you know, spiritual masters arrived, they would go out and meet them, and they would try to listen to them and see what they have to say. So this Ratapama goes out. The Buddha has right, okay, let's go out and see him. So he goes out and the Buddha gives a talk and then everyone is kind of, yeah, yeah, okay, that's good, and then they leave. But one person remains behind after the talk is finished. That's Ratapama. And he says, Master, this is so this is such this is such good stuff. Yeah, he doesn't say it exactly that way, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I want to ordain. I'd like to become a monk. And then the Buddha says to him, Well, have you got your parents' permission? This is, and this is very interesting because this is a problem everyone has once you become one, become a monk. Yeah, everyone has this problem. Your parents are not all that keen on it. Uh, you want to become a monk? Are you sure you want to become a monk? But, but, you know, what went wrong? You know, am I going to become a monk or not? That's crazy. And of course, the point why people say that is because they have no clue about Buddhism. If they understood what Buddhism was all about, they would say, "Good on you. Get in there as quickly as you can. Yeah, before you change your mind." Go. No. <laughs> That's the right attitude if you understand what it's all about. But of course, people don't understand that, and because they don't understand, that's why they are reluctant. <coughs> happened with my parents, happens with almost anyone who wants to go forward. It's not easy to convince your parents that this is a good idea. So he says to the world, Yes, I'm going to make sure my parents say yes to this. Yeah, I get my parents' permission. But he happens to be the only son. And of course, in an Indian family, yeah, if you are the only son, that's kind of. The last person you want to give up is your only son in the family because he's going to take over the family business and all of these kind of things. So he goes back to his parents and he says to his parents, I'd like to go for it. What do you say? We say, no, no way. Absolutely no chance that you're going to go for it. Yeah, you are dear and beloved to us. We have done everything for you in this life. There's no way you're going to become a monk. And so he says, well, in that case, I'm going to lie down on the ground right here and either you give me the going forward or I die while I, while I lie down on the ground. And then the days start to go by. Yeah, One day, two days, three days, four days, seven days. And he hasn't eaten anything for seven days. He's been lying in one spot on the ground. And his parents start to get a bit desperate because they, they, they obviously realize he's pretty serious about this. And of course, later on, Dr. Pala becomes the disciple of the Buddha who had the most faith. Yeah? You have this category of leading disciples in various categories, and he was the one with the most confidence and faith. So he lies down on the ground, and eventually his parents start to get desperate. So he get his friends to come in and try to persuade him. Please, Dr. Pala, get up. Enjoy and use yourself and make merry. Yeah? That's what they say. This is how lots of people think these days as well. We will make merry and enjoy and amuse ourselves at the same time. Win win situation. That's how people think. Yeah? Actually, it's good, but it's not, you know, I'm not sure if it's a win-win, but anyway. <laughs> so then his friends go to Dr. Pala and say, please, Dr. Pala, your parents make sense, yeah? Enjoy yourself, you come from a wealthy family, everything is good for you, you have been well-educated, you've got everything in life, but why on earth don't you want, you know, do what they say? And he says, no chance, I will not, uh, no, no way, I'm absolutely committed to this. So his parents, his friends go to his parents and say, well, and he's committed, and yeah, he, he either if you don't let, let him go forward, he will die right there. But if you do let him go, go forward, he may come back and visit you after he's gone forward. And his parents think, yeah, you know, good point, yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay, let, let, let him go forward. So eventually he goes forward, and he goes forward, and he goes to see the Buddha, he becomes an Arahant, yeah. And after he becomes an Arahant, he says to the Buddha, oh, actually now I'd like to go back and see my parents, because I promised to go back and see them after some stage. 
And of course, this is very interesting because once you become an Arahant, things have changed just a little bit. Uh, you are not exactly as they were before anymore. But his parents don't get that. Uh, so he goes back to his parents, and initially they don't recognize him, but after a while they kind of get him invited to the house. Uh, and uh, you know they, they they want to trap him. They want to bring him back to the household life. So they put two piles of gold in the house. Uh, yeah, large piles of gold. They're taller than the taller than a man's height. Uh, and in between these two piles of gold, they put a chair, and they say to their daughter-in-law, you know, Dr. Paula's old wife, they say, okay, okay, now get kind of put on all your jewelry and makeup and make yourself look really nice, yeah? We're going to kind of get him back into the house of life again. And they put her on a chair between these two piles of gold, and they put a curtain around it, and, and say to her, oh, now, please, please come, Dr. Paula, and sit down over here, yeah? And he sees these curtains and he's wondering what's going on here. This <laughs> these curtains didn't used to be here. What's, what's happening in this house? Uh, and then Rabbi Paula comes into the house and then they, uh, uh, when he sits down and kind of make him feel comfortable, whatever, they pull aside the curtain and they say, Rabbi Paula, all this is yours. All you have to do is to come back to the house all night. But he's an arahant, yeah? <laughs> it's too late. He's not going to come back to the house all night anymore. Yeah. So he uh, then he. Uh, and he says to his father, he says, well, you know, if you would listen to me, father, or he actually calls his father householder. Yeah, that's already kind of, the, you don't call your father householder, right? <laughs> if I called my father householder, he would probably faint. <laughs> <what's going> on. <laughs> so that's what he does. He calls his father householder. The father's not very happy with that. He says, householder, if you were to listen to me, I would give you, give you some advice on what to do with all this gold. And his father says, okay, give, you know, Big gruff, yeah, we give you advice, yeah, well, let's, just, let's see what it is. And he said, well, if I were you, I would take this gold and I would have some large sacks, large kind of hempen sacks, put all the gold into those hempen sacks, uh, sew them up, load them onto oxen carts, uh, take those oxen carts, drive them out into the middle of the river Ganges and dump it all into the river Ganges. Uh, and his father is not amused. <laughs> his, his father starts to realize what has happened to my son. And he's, he's very, he's quite upset with this. So, but the father says, why is that? Well, he says, because all this gold and silver or whatever it is, it will only cause you trouble. You have to guard it, look after it. Much better to get rid of it all. Now. This kind of shows the difference between the Arahant's point of view and the kind of ordinary householder's point of view. Now. So at this point, you know, I, I, the story goes on for quite a while. There's lots of little kind of interesting things in that story, yeah. but then eventually his parents realize actually there is, you know, there's no hope, and they kind of let him let him go. Yeah, and they sort of, so he goes on to the forest, and hopefully, uh, it doesn't say that in the story, but some of what happens is that you know your parents will have a bit of a conversion. They will realize actually maybe we made a mistake in here. There's something happened to our son. He kind of seems much more serene and peaceful than he was before. And very often that would be the case, that you actually have a very strong impact on your family if you live in the right way and you have these profound insights. One of the things the Buddha says, when a, you know, a, a young person in the family goes forward and they practice the path, it has a beneficial effect on the entire family. It's a very positive thing when that happens. And this is one of the great things with the monastic life. You tend to bring other people along with you. So that is maybe what happened with his parents afterwards. It doesn't say that, but very quite possibly that's what happened afterwards. But anyway, so he goes off and he, and he goes off, off into the local forest. And he goes there to meditate and just to uh, take it easy. And as he does so, the local king comes out. Yeah, and the local king come, comes to see him. And this is where this uh, suit that starts to take off. Uh, because the local king is kind of surprised. This young man from his own town went forth. Uh, and he wants to find out why that is the case. What is it that made young people in the prime of life go forth? And this is what this sutta is about. So let's have a start with that, just a couple of minutes towards the very end. Let's have a, have a look at this. And King Kurabia sat down on the seat made ready and said, Master Ratapala, there are these four kinds of loss. Because they have undergone these four kinds of loss, some people here shave off their hair and beard, put on the yellow robe or the ochre robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. What are the four? They are the loss through old age, the loss through illness, the loss of wealth, and the loss of relatives. 
Yeah, this is why people tended to go forth in ancient India because, well, there wasn't much point to life anymore. There wasn't much, you know, you, you couldn't really, uh, you, you know, life was really over for you because you had lost everything. You're getting old and sick and all these kind of things. And that is why people go forth. But, but Ratapala, he shattered that stereotype because Ratapala is still young. And he comes from a wealthy family. He has lots of family and, and, and friends, and he is in good health. So he had none of these problems. So why is it? What is the thing that made Ratapala go forth? And uh, so this is interesting, yeah, because I'm not going to read any further now. I'll, I'll save this for this afternoon. But so this, what this means is that when Ratapala heard this, uh, he became a monastic. Uh, so I, this will be a test for this afternoon. When you hear this, uh, will you become a monastic? Yeah? <laughs> this is, kind of a, it, uh, is this going to have the same impact on you as it had on Ratapala? So we will see. It depends on my ability to explain it. Uh, because we did. The pressure is on me, right, to get this right. Uh, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, anyway, I'm going to stop there because it is almost uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, and uh, just very briefly, there were a couple of people who wanted to uh, have a chat. Uh, and I will be available in the interview room at that quarter to 11 or so. Uh, so if you, anyone wants to come there and have a talk about something in the last minute, you're welcome to come. Certainly those people, one or two, who wanted to have a talk, you will Please come over there uh, about quarter to 11. Uh, before that, I will have a chat with Venerable Chanda. So, uh, but uh, around that time, I should be ready and free here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that's all for now. So, keep, please keep on enjoying yourself for the last day or so. Uh, and then uh, see you again at 3.30 this afternoon.